one 1,000, two 1,000, three 1,000. <laughs> Good morning. I'd like to welcome everyone to worship here at Trinitarian Congregational Church. Whether you're here in the sanctuary or joining us online, I'm truly humbled and honored by your presence this morning. I do ask that you just take a moment to greet or to observe who you're worshiping with this morning as we never enter worship as strangers, but always as brothers and sisters of the Most High God. So take a moment just to say hello and greet one another. Uh, a couple of announcements for the uh, good of the community. First, uh, no after worship service. There'll be a, a time of uh, light refreshments in our parlor, and our parlor is out this door and down the long hallway. So I hope you take some time to uh, gather and greet one another afterwards to continue to build on the bonds of fellowship here. Uh, this Wednesday, uh, there is a food drive uh, that we'll be doing from 8 o'clock to 4 or 5 o'clock. Um, so you can bring the food and drop it off under the portico out here, or there is a little box uh, if you want to drop it off during the week, whether Wednesday meet, meet your needs or Monday is better for you. But please, if you can help us support uh, the food pantry, and please, if you know about this, please, if you have social media, share that we are doing a food drive and let people know about it. Um, 
Let me see what else. That's that's all I have. Uh, please bear with me because this is the best my voice has sounded since Wednesday. So uh, I'm hoping I got everything. All right. So next thing is, uh, if this is your first time with us, please know that you're welcome here. If you've been with us many times before, you are welcome here. If you come with questions, doubts, or wonder, you are welcome here. If you come knowing exactly what you believe, or if you come with little belief or no belief, that you are welcome here. For as our denomination, the United Church of Christ says, no matter who you are or where you are in life's journey, you are welcomed here. And let us now join in the responsive call to worship as it is printed in the bulletin. We gather in the name of the risen Lord. Christ is risen, alleluia. We gather as sisters and brothers of the resurrected one. Christ is risen, alleluia. We gather to share our faith and to worship God. Christ is risen, alleluia. We gather to proclaim the good news of Easter. Christ is risen, alleluia. Our opening hymn is number 192 in the hymnal, The Day of Resurrection, and I invite you, if you wish, to help us sing it by rising either in spirit or in body. Please be seated. The scripture reading for this morning is from the book of Acts, the fifth book of the New Testament, most likely recorded many years after the life and death and resurrection of Jesus. And this morning's story is kind of a fast forward in the story of God's grace, that Jesus had come back to the disciples, had been taken up, and the Holy Spirit had been given. But it now tells us about how those who followed Jesus proceeded to be in community with one another. So let us listen, and may God add a blessing to our reading and hearing of these words. Now the whole group of those who believed were of one heart and soul. And no one claimed private ownership of any possessions, but everything they owned was held in common. With great power, the apostles gave their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them, 
For as many as owned lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold. They laid the proceeds at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had need. May the Lord's blessings be added to our hearing of these words for our day. Uh, so this morning, uh, let me see, no kids are here. So I'm going to not do a word for all ages, but so after the prayer, we'll go into the Lord's Prayer, just so the bulletin is going to seem a little off and different. But first of all, uh, as a response to hearing God's word for us, to thank all of you who have supported the ongoing ministries here at Trinitarian, to thank you for your gifts of time and talent and treasure. Offering plates are in the front and at the back, and there's also a QR code if you wish to give electronically on the back page of the bulletin, or for those of you watching at home, you may do so that way, but thank you for that. And now let us take a moment to enter into a time of prayer with God, and let us begin in silence that we may offer the prayers of our hearts. Oh, gracious God, we come before you on this second Sunday of Easter. Perhaps a little tired from the preparations and the celebration of last Sunday. Wondering where are all the people that we saw last week. And wondering what you have in store for us this week. And how can we hear the message of the resurrection yet once again? So as we gather this morning, we give you thanks for the glorious message that you bring, new hope out of despair, resurrection out of defeat, and new life out of death. You give living water so that new life blossoms. You urge flowers to push their way through winter-hardened soil. We bring before you the dead and dried out places in our lives that through your touch, we may rediscover newness of life, perhaps forgotten dreams, lapsed intentions, hardened resentments, griefs to which we cling like children who cling to a worn but cherished toy or blanket. So these we hand over to you, knowing that you will return them mended, washed, renewed, and transformed. We bring before you the places in our lives and in our world where despair reigns unchallenged. With grief, we bring our concerns for the parts of the world where the cycles of violence goes on and on and on. We come to pray for those who are in need of your healing touch, whether it be in mind, body, or spirit. Point us towards actions, however small, which lead to a more hopeful future for ourselves and for our world. Gracious God, we thank you that you walk beside us as we journey through life. Because you are with us, we accept each new day with its joys and sorrows as a gift. Because you are with us, we gain courage to meet the challenge of the day, choosing life and not death as we move through time. As you raise Jesus from the dead, raise us to new life this day and every day. This we pray in the name of the risen Christ, the one who taught his disciples to pray by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. 
Amen. So this is the first time in 25 years that I decided not to preach on the Gospel of John after Easter. I've looked at Thomas so many different ways, the locked doors, the fear. I just didn't have anything new that I could contribute to it. And I was like, oh, what are you going to preach on? And then I saw this, this uh, lectionary uh, scripture from Acts. And I have to say, this, this scripture is challenging because if, if you want, uh, how many of you all want to like join together? Let's go sell our homes, everything that we have, put it in one big pot, and then we'll take care of one another here at the church. Any takers? I didn't think so. Uh, and I sometimes use this, uh, this text when I argue, uh, argue, debate, my more conservative friends when they talk about, yes, I believe in the Bible. I was like, okay, so you're going to sell your house and move in with your friends and share everything? No. You said you believe in the Bible. It's in the Bible. There it is. You got to go do it. They don't like that argument. Now, but the words that caught me was not so much, um, and it is important for us to hear that um, this takes place about 50 days after the resurrection, uh, it's Pentecost. Pentecost was the um, celebration of the spring harvest, but it was also the spirit of God had been given or renewed to the disciples to take them out of a small room and bring them out into the world. Now it says that the disciples were there and it said that they sold everything and they lived together and they gave as anyone had need. But the words that caught my attention were the following just two words 
in verse 33. In great grace, in great grace was upon them all. Great grace. Huh. What is great grace? I don't know. What does it mean to be great and graceful at the same time? I can tell you, I can show you grace. I can show you two forms of grace. Well, no, maybe I can only show you one form of grace. Last night, uh, dance competition for my daughter. And I, I always say this. It's, I always marvel at the grace at which these young women can move across the stage, telling a story. Sometimes, I, uh, sometimes because of the music, and I'm old, I get it, that sometimes I don't know the song, so I don't know the story they're trying to tell at first, but if you watch and watch the gracefulness of what they do and how they move, they, they tell this wonderful story that invites you, invites you in. But a great grace that I think that we want to live into is beyond, beyond that dance mode of a, a, move, a, a movement of grace for a body, bodily posture. But what is great grace? And one of the things that I've been working on with my spiritual director for the last six years is how to be grateful and how to receive gratefulness and how to give gratefulness. Now, one of the things that when my life took a, tr took a tremendous twist and turn that I didn't expect, um, money was a little tight and I had to pay my accountant. I called him and I said, hey, uh, I, can't, I can't pay the bill all at once but I can make some installments. He said to me, and I can still remember the conversation, but I can remember my reaction. He said, listen, don't worry about it. This year's on me. Cried for 10 minutes because it was, it was only a $300 bill, but I didn't have $300. And the way I was raised was that if someone performs a service, you, you pay them for it. And he said, no, he goes, this is, this is how we take care of people, is we, we give grace and we do things for them. The disciples, the apostles were told a great grace had come upon them. In this Easter season, I wonder what that means for us to live into the resurrection and to show great grace. What does it mean to have great grace? Well, I got thinking about uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, um, German pastor back in the 30s who wrote a book called The Cost of Discipleship and he talked about cheap grace where we take for granted the things that God has done for us and we don't really pay much attention to those things. He talks about there being a costly grace and what did he say here? He goes, oh, he said, he began to pe preach about an importance of a costly faith that embodied a transformative practice of gratitude. He wrote in his book, after he had been imprisoned by Hitler, in normal life, one is, is not all that aware that we always receive infinitely more than we give, and that gratitude is what enriches life. One easily overestimates the importance of one's own acts and deeds compared with what we become only through other people. That this grace we talk about of God, the resurrection faith, of seeing new life, seeing new things spring forth, but how do we see such a miraculous transformation in life if we don't begin by giving grace, thankfulness, gratitude, for when we wake up in the morning, for when we have that first bite of food, for when we turn on the shower and it's hot water, for when we get to do X, Y, and Z, the everyday normal living things that we take for granted. And so showing the grace for that and developing gratitude in a way that helps us not underestimate the routine of life, but also the interactions that we have for people. One of the things that 
uh, been tremendously grateful for is someone here has kept me in the loop about people who have gone into the hospital. And uh, I wouldn't have known otherwise. I don't know why the people who, I, I understand why the people who probably went into the hospital didn't say, hey, I'll tell the minister, but they told someone, and someone told me, which allowed me to act. This week, it was a phone call, because I'm figuring the hospital staff was going to say, no, you can't come in here. Um, But the gratitude of having someone making you aware that someone is in need is helpful. The gratitude that we are asked to have, this greater grace that the disciples had, because they shared They shared their lives, and their lives were enriched. And it says a greater grace was bestowed upon them. I still can't fathom it. I still can't fathom what they did. They sold everything, living together in a greater grace, the cost of what they did, giving up everything that they had to live in a community, to depend upon one another with all their strengths, all their weaknesses, all their foibles, all their goodnesses. And the grace of God brings them together. The only other act of grace that, um, it didn't happen to me, but it happened to a seminary classmate. They were taking a class in Paul's letters, and the professor, they walked in, the professor said, all right, write your name down on your blue book, hand it in. They were like, what? Uh, we have to take the test. She goes, no, this is the test. This is what I've been teaching you about all semester, about grace. Write your name on the blue book, hand it in. You all have 100 on this exam. I was told that two people in the class argued with her (laughs) incessantly for 20 minutes because they couldn't believe the grace that they were shown. They couldn't accept it. They felt like they had to earn it. And here's the issue that we need to remember in the church as people of the resurrection and people who follow Christ. None of us here can earn God's grace. For God freely bestows this grace upon us each and every day. It's free every day. There's nothing, not one thing you can do to earn it. Not one thing. I want you to hear that. Not one thing you can do to earn it. Because it's already been given. It's been given by God freely for you to accept, to embrace this way of living and of life that is countercultural to the world and to share it with the people that you come in contact with. To share this grace, to help the person who needs the hand up, not the hand out. To help the person whose car may be broken down, whether that's with a phone call or maybe you're blessed with the mechanical skills to to, to fix their car. To share these things, to share of ourselves, and I think that is the greater grace that is talked about by the writer of Acts. Talks about the sharing of ourselves and our lives in a way that enriches the world, that helps others, and to show God's grace out into the world. One of these moments of grace for me was um, last week. I was cleaning up the pulpit, uh, and I keep a prayer or two there just in case things forget. But I found this exercise that a coffer man did. I won't say who, but both his parents are here. One's the choir director, one's videotaping the service. written by Miles, but that year in confirmation, I asked them to define grace, and this, this definition of grace I love, and I'm going to keep this forever. It says, grace is God's love for you, that God has had for you since and before you were born. It is a gift that you are always worthy of, and even when You're not, and you're called to give it away, to let others feel it. You will never lose any of it. It is the things that you give to others whenever you help someone 
Yet it never leaves you no matter how much you give away. It is not one particular thing, but everything that could be given in kindness. He should sell this and get it copyrighted, really, he should. This grace, this greater grace that God calls us to share in the resurrection is each and every day. How do we show gratefulness for the love which God has given to us the love that we are asked to share. How do we develop a sense of gratitude each and every day that leads us to see this greater grace in everyday living, in a living that could transform the world if we can help people see that gratitude for the things that we already have to refocus how we look at the world. Instead of saying, this is what the world owes me, to say, I am blessed by what the world has already given me. May we continue to share this resurrection love that God has given to us through Jesus. Would you join with me now in the prayer for transformation and new life? We use a lot of words, gracious God, but do little to turn them into deeds. Instead of being of one heart and soul, we choose sides and form groups of folks just like us, blessed with great grace We have trouble sharing this grace with those who need it the most. Forgive us, God of love. Forgive us as we step out of our shadows into your light. Restore us as we reveal our brokenness. Hear us as we proclaim the risen Christ and seek to follow in his ways. Amen. Our closing hymn is on the opposite page of the bulletin, God of grace and God of glory, and I invite you to help us sing it, if you wish, by rising in body or in spirit.
And now as our service of worship comes to a close, may our service of witness and following the risen Christ continue wherever we go. Before I offer the blessing, remember to join us for fellowship down in our parlor, right out this door, and again down the long hallway, that we take time to get to know one another and to share stories and get to know God's grace from one another even more. Now as we go forth, go forth knowing that the resurrected Christ goes before you, imploring you to share the grace of God's love for the people that you will encounter, that wherever you go on this odd and wondrous journey of life, that you are not alone, that God goes before you, next to you, and behind you, lifting you in love and in strength, fit for service, to serve and to love one another, to give grace, to receive grace, and to continue to grow in God's love. Go forth in Christ's name. Amen and amen.